to Simpler. We are three pastors, husbands, and fathers on a journey to make life simpler by holding Jesus as the core for every belief and practice. This journey has shaped us to be more like Christ, freed us from the shame of failure, and encouraged us to a deeper love of our Lord and God. We invite you to join us in the discussions that have shaped and continue to shape our lives. I will (laughs) never forget going to the hospital. And you'd been sick for so many days. That's about the most like helpless I've ever been. In my and life. you're like, Hey, I need to go to the bathroom. We're waiting in the ER. And I was like, okay, what do you, how do I help you? And you're like, just stand up and I'll grab your shoulders. And you just put your head against my back and just shuffled to the bathroom. It's like being blind. Like that's yeah. how bad it was. It's like, I mean, I could kind of see, but yeah, you, you were not lifting your head up. I had no concept yeah. of like what, yeah, like mm. barely. The only reason I felt up and down is because of gravity. Yeah. Literally. Gravity's a scam. Did you know, yes. yeah. did I ever tell you guys that, uh, well, first of all, they found a, or determined later it was a uh, sinus infection that was attacking my central nervous system. Mm-hmm. And then there was another lady. When was that? That that time. Okay. Because it went on for so long. Yeah. And they wouldn't give me antibiotics. So anyways, it pisses me off. Now mm-hmm. I know. There's another lady, a friend of the Trujillos, um, that had the same thing and they didn't catch it. And now she has permanent damage to her central nervous system because they didn't treat it quick enough. And now she's like, I've wondered if this is like, I did do some damage because of how quickly I get dizzy now Mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, But hers is like consistent. Like probably what you're feeling now is like nonstop every single day Yeah, because it did damage. So now I'm like, if someone ever calls me again and says like, I've been dizzy for a day, I'm going to be like, tell your doctor to give you antibiotics right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting how, it changes like our perspective changes on those kinds of things because I would be like, okay, so you're dizzy. You got a headache. You need some more water. You need some yeah, sleep yeah. Or whatever. And all those things could be true. Could be. But because of your experience now, you're going to be like, dude. <laughs> like, and actually yeah. I think I could, I think I could have a conversation with someone and figure it out pretty quick. Yeah. Like if it's like, oh, you're dehydrated or sure. mm-hmm. you have an allergic reaction. But you have like, that experience now, which allows you to have another option. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, Michelle's mom had, had been having some stomach pain. We took her to the ER or she went to the ER and we went up there like three or four times over 18 month period and they couldn't ever find anything wrong. And, um, so we started thinking maybe it was something dietary, Mm -hmm. like causing just intestinal pain. So she started trying to be careful what she's eating, pay attention to what she's eating. Finally went in and just got, she said, can I just be admitted to the hospital? Because they had scheduled a thing for like six weeks out she goes, can I just be admitted to the hospital? And then they'll do the thing. Yeah. And then the hospitalist that was there, whoever it was, was like, oh, I, I bet I know what this is. And like ran a test. I'm like, yep, you have a you have a hernia that's caused this kind of like little oh my gosh. perforation. Just needed or to whatever. get a doctor who had the experience to know what who it was. knew. Yep. And and uh she had surgery a couple months ago and she's like, like, man, I just I feel really good. Huh. And mm-hmm. it's just poor lady had been like hurting this whole time and she would, she would there would be things in her body or her activity that would aggravate the hernia and cause it to be really painful. And then that Mm -hmm. would send her to the ER and then she'd be fine for a few weeks. And then, but finally somebody just had experienced it enough that they were like, Hey, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, cause I kept telling her, I was like, I I told, I feel so bad. I was like, yeah, it's gotta be something you're eating. Like, I'm just thinking, I'm not thinking it's something that she needs surgery for, but I just didn't have the experience. So now I'm like, all right, put that in the memory bank and be like, I mean, it makes sense, but mm-hmm. your first thought would be you're allergic to something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And our, our bodies do change as we get mm-hmm. older and there's different like, so I was just like, oh yeah, we got to figure out what, what you're eating that's messing you up. Yeah. yeah. And here I am making my mother-in-law hurt. Come on, man. I know she's like so stinking sweet yeah. and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just what you're eating. Okay. I know. Wow. Jerk. You're a jerk. Let's go to the PCC. Let's do it. Come on over to Pierce's Culture Corner, everybody. All right. So, uh, what I want to do is just kind of like give the rundown of kind of what's going on in Texas, at least at this time, this is a few weeks before this episode airs. So things may have changed, but, uh, Pornhub was suspended. Sorry, excuse me. Pornhub suspended their service to Texans arguing a state law infringes on adult rights to access protected speech. So I've seen, I've, I've seen the headlines and things going around. I've seen clickbaity type of stuff. Wait, what was that statement again? Uh, Pornhub has suspended service to Texans, arguing a state law infringes on adults' rights to access protected speech. 
Um, oh, so Texas did a law, and then Pornhub is responding, responding saying we're yeah. taking away. So the way that I've heard we're it presented away is porn. Texas banned Pornhub, but that's not that's what not happened. True. Pornhub left because of a law that I think is still getting put into effect. And they said, "Well, this is basically what's going to happen if this gets put into effect." By now, I think it's been voted on, but I for, I don't know exactly what all the things it has to go through for that to take place. Because I'm just going to read this this like bit. My question is kind of what they're getting at is that the law is infringing or sorry, constricting free speech is the language they're using. So I put, I got some like summary statements. I didn't realize porn was free speech. <laughs> Dude, there's, there's like a whole port, part of this article, porn, part of this article, corn of this article that, um, highlights how adult entertainment has been like the catalyst of all culture. And I'm like, Come on. Okay. <laughs> like, Come uh, on. I so, yeah. So I'm like we can have the conversation if you want to, but we don't need to. Anyway. No. Come on. So uh, this is from Justice John Paul Stevens. He wrote, "As a matter of constitutional." Whoa, whoa, John Paul Stevens. I know, isn't that crazy? Uh, As a matter of constitutional tradition, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, we presume that government regulation of the content of speech is more likely to interfere with the free exchange of ideas than to encourage it. Basically, if, if the government can... Wait, who's, in, who's John Paul Stevens? Uh, Justice John Paul Stevens wrote the majority of the this opinion in the Reno versus American Civil Liberties Union. So I haven't read the entirety of the... Is he a Supreme Court justice? Um, I don't know. We can Google that. I've never heard that sure. name before. Uh, I also don't know if I know all I the had, names I had of the a justices. neighbor, neighbor sure. named uh, John uh, Paul when I was a kid. He may have just been one of the ones that presided over Reno versus American Civil Liberties Union. Um I can look that up for sure. But he could have been in the Supreme Court because the next thing I have coming. I don't know who else is a justice. So that's why I thought. Anyways, go ahead. Uh, next one is uh, I didn't, I did forgot to copy and paste his first name, but his last name is Goldman. Goldman said the Supreme Court has already ruled on the regulation of online obscene materials in light of the Ginsburg, uh, which is the, I had to put a summary for this. So what he means by that is a Ginsburg v. somebody or something. It's the nation's high, highest court case that decided. Uh, that, that children could be constitutionally denied access to material that was, quote, harmful to minors. Um, so in the Ginsburg case, the, the Supreme Court decided that they could intervene and say that this is harmful to minors and they could be constitutionally denied access. Goldman also said that, that the nation's highest court determined that the Internet was different than the offline world and that the two cannot be treated the same way. So even within that case, they're acknowledging differences between mm -hmm. uh, physical objects mm -hmm. or online objects. So then he says he maintained Texas's age verif verification requirement is categorically unconstitutional because it forces all users to complete a mechanical process before accessing protected material, which can slow people down as an and act as a barrier to content. <laughs> Goldman added that it drags down the earning potential of publishers and adds costs to the users who create content. So I tried to just get a blurb of this whole entire article that I read. Uh, and so I know that some of this may be taken out of context for sure, but this is basically his whole stance is this has been decided on that the, that the government can interfere, but offline and online things, uh, goods are different. And then he says that it has, if we put a process between the adult trying to get the, on the adult material, then it is hindering them briefly. And so therefore we shouldn't put a law into effect because it's hindering their rights to free speech. My initial concern, the, the content's still there for you to consume. Right. There's an added step for you to get that content. I think, I think a highlight, a bigger part of what he says is it drags down ad revenue because you're not getting all the ad revenue for all the people, the point that he makes. They there. don't feel that way about guns. And that's what I'm, that's like, that's why I feel weird that I don't feel like it's constraining. I don't feel like it's constraining no. a right. I feel like it is. Yeah, but they're is, not arguing with guns. They're not arguing free speech is being infringed upon. But some people, so like the right to bear arms, right? Have people made that argument that like, well, I have to do a back, okay. or I have to fill out whatever, whatever okay. paperwork or. You, you can't go into certain casinos or bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At a certain age. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my point is there's, there's restrictions and it doesn't, and keep, even, it doesn't keep the other people who have to show their ID from going in. And Correct. the online stuff, I, from my understanding, online gambling is the same way. So like, even if you want to see, make the online yep. argument, you still have to be an adult to yep. all gamble online. Yep. And it's it's and state regulated, a, which we just found out that. Uh, well, what what they want is they want they want to get children and other people addicted to porn as quickly oh, as they can, yeah, yeah. and what they want is to be able to utilize child images and different. When, I don't typically I, over like make these like seemingly over spiritualized things, but this to me feels demonic. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah, I hundred percent agree. That's I th it feels like such backwards arguments that don't 
that wouldn't be the case in other scenarios. Yeah, they don't like. argue it for this. My point is like they're yeah. not arguing. Okay, even taking guns out, I think it's a fair point, Ryan, that that's not free speech. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not arguing for them. I'm yeah, just yeah. Saying. I'm just, but it's a fair point. So you'd have to yeah. be more like in the realm of what they're saying, which would be bars and uh, mm -hmm. um, gambling, gambling and games, yep. weather. Uh, and casinos might be the best. Because they, have, because they have on, well, no, thing, yeah. they have online and in person. So that's the yeah, casinos exactly. yeah. would be great. A great example. If they're not fighting for it with casinos, then yeah. Where, yeah, yeah, where yeah, is true. it then? Which I, I, so I know based it's off funny that to me that they line, still say adult films and then are arguing that it shouldn't just be for adults. Yeah. It's what, well, what's so weird that this feels so backwards to me too. This was like a, this was in response, like as a pro, like, yeah, we should fight for our free speech. This wasn't a bias on the other side. I tried to avoid some of the Christian articles that are uh, just to see like, what is, how is the world perceiving this? And so that was the quote they decided to give out. Hey, the adults can be minorly inconvenienced and that's hindering their free speech. That feels like a <laughs> snowflake type of statement. Like if I've ever heard well, one, like, so like, this has that's really your kids. argument. Yeah. So like, and the, I think, the, I think or the last speech. line, I think the last line gives it away for sure. He added that it drags down the earning potential. If you rip away underage uh, kids looking at these porn sites, how much ad money you're actually going to make. And so like, yeah, I'm assuming they do it like YouTube based on views. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. I would, I, mean, I would assume so as well, or, or just numbers of clicks or how much, how long the eyes stay on a certain part of the site. And mm. so like, if you go down, I mean, even, even if I know this is nowhere near the stats, but let's just say 30%, now 30% of your revenues pulled away. Of course, you're going to have this sort of argument yeah, yeah. in, in court. Like, of course you're going to have these things. So, um, I don't, my first thought is I don't feel like this is constricting free speech, but rather putting up barriers that we've already put up in other areas. Exactly. Like you said, gambling. Um, and like, and like you had mentioned as well, you can still order uh, tobacco and alcohol online. There's still a barrier you have oh, to go to, true. to do mm -hmm. that. And that's so true. like to obtain those goods online, there's a barrier you have to go to. Well, now you're going to restrict my, my right to, to drink. No, show me your ID. Like, yeah. like show me that well, you it, can get these things. It's because it, like you said, Micah, there, there's not an interest in protecting children. There's there's an in interest probably in cultivating children. Well, you know mm -hmm. that's the case yeah. because all yeah. these freaking uh, school districts are putting books in their library, yep. kids' mm -hmm. li elementary school libraries. Mm -hmm. And then these parents are getting kicked out of the school board meetings yep. by bringing this stuff up. I know. It's funny, right? Like, the, yeah. So it's my go. freaking kid. You <laughs> they're coming in and they're reading the book in a school board meeting. And then the school board's shutting them down going, you can't yeah. read that book in here. Well, my, then why in the talk, world? Yeah. My it? favorite is the black pastor from like North Carolina who does mm -hmm. this. And he's got this like real eloquent voice and he's reading these books. And I'm like, this is amazing because <laughs> yeah. it's awkward. And he keeps coming back and doing it and he makes it awkward. Oh, it's so good. I love it. Yeah. I will be that guy here if they do that. Yeah. Someone tell me, do we have books like that in SASD? Well, Can I was going to ask too, like, what is, I know that we're going a little long, I apologize, but like, what, what is the definition of like a banned book? And so like, I was talking to him about this the other day because I saw a list of, of banned books in the U S and I was like, I know for certain this book isn't banned in the U S I know that they probably pulled it out of some schools. They probably don't allow it in some certain libraries. But this book isn't, I can still go purchase that book. So like, right. what, I guess, what is the definition of banned? Is it just if it's banned I have in no one? Idea. I, I was, it probably depends on the argument the person's trying to make. Yeah, It's Cause, cause probably books, similar to marijuana. It's okay. a federally banned substance, but states legalize it. So like, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. not going to get in trouble from the state authorities, but you could get in trouble from a federal yeah. authority. So if like Mertzen ISD says like, we won't allow that book here. Now all of a sudden it's on the banned list because one one library. Well, I don't think that's what that means. Oh, okay. I think that's like a, I think that's like a federal thing. I got you. I got you. Um, because one of the books, what, what caught my eye about it was one of the books was a book I actually enjoyed, but there is a gay character in the book. And I was like, I totally understand that. Like if, the, if we're talking about elementary school, that, that's not debating, like dealing with any issues that they should deal with, but it also doesn't glorify homosexuality. Like a lot of the other books that they're pulling out of schools do. Yeah, most of the it's books. It's just a fictional book that has a gay most character Most of the books that the parents are showing in school board meetings are like pretty. It's like teaching sexual. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Act, acts so anyway i'm curious about that as well just how is it's, band defined but i think if you're posting online it's defined however you want to define it uh for the individual posting i think there has to be some sort of overarching what's definition. funny is last thought there's a group of people that seem to be out to protect kids mm -hmm. and then there's a demonic influence that says nope yep that's exactly right agreed ryan hey man what are we talking about today man well, we're not talking about banned books, although now I'm going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> no, you can learn for me. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'm going to keep doing that, just sowing those seeds for you to do all yeah, the yeah. research. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, you know, pornography, banned books, these kinds of things, it brings us to the place where we're going to ask the question, <laughs> is God really <laughs> the standard for what is true? 
is God really, do we really believe as, I'll say it this way, the three of us would argue that God is the final authoritative standard for everything that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, But in our culture, and especially Christian culture, because I don't care about the people who don't profess to know Jesus, Mm -hmm. but especially amongst those who are calling themselves Christians, is there really a consensus that God is the standard uh, for what is true? But Ryan, isn't my truth my truth, regardless of what the Bible says? So, Mike, I was thinking that <laughs> it's probably time we fire him. <laughs> I mean, it help our budget out a lot. That's true. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> I'll call up the, the pecs and just tell them we've got their, their salary. <laughs> yeah, taking you're care taking care of them. Come it on, wasn't down. that big of a deal when we none of us were getting paid? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> See what I'm saying? Is money is always what it boils down to. <laughs> so, uh, you know, well, actually, Pierce, um, there is in our culture, uh, I mean, and it's not, it's not new. I mean, we'd be fooling ourselves to say that it was new, but there it's literally in Genesis three. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there's this idea that is pervasive among people who, and, and I'm going to say that this is across the board. There is an idea that is pervasive among people who do not know God, that, uh, truth is relative. Mm-hmm. And, and so, the idea, and and almost always, almost always, they are these people are trying to get everybody to believe what they believe. They surround themselves with people who believe what they believe. And I, I know that our critics are going to say, "Well, you're only surrounding yourself with people who believe what you believe." the The difference is that I'm not. we are trying to. Uh, our aim is to shape our view of the world based on what God declares is true rather than what we declare is true. Mm -hmm. Now, are there people who misuse the scripture and misapply the scripture? And sure, all the time. But what we three would argue is that there is an absolute truth found in God. Mm -hmm. And the aim of the Christian is to to find out what that is. So like, for example- Or maybe we should say like to let that shape how we view reality. Absolutely, yeah. Instead we, of instead of it being like a search of like I would really like to find someday what the truth is, right? Letting saying we acknowledge that reality or truth is based on God, yeah, and we want our lives to be affected by that reality. So right. the more that we seek to understand God, the more we become a, more aligned, I guess, with what's yeah. actually true. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, th- where I see this conversation happening the most is in in uh, conversations dealing with love and goodness and so you will talk to somebody about love and they'll say well i love so and so and here's what i found like every every couple that i've ever in 29 years of ministry taught to for marriage counseling every couple every one of them has said i love my spouse every one of them but they're in marriage counseling because of heartbreak and betrayal and hurt, sometimes adultery, sometimes pornography, sometimes just uh, not knowing how to communicate with each other and they fight all the time or whatever, right? And, and so they always insist that they love one another. And then I will always ask the question, or I have the last probably 10 years, I've asked the question, based on what standard? You're calling this love. What standard are you using? Mm -hmm. Because what you're calling love, I wouldn't call love. Mm -hmm. And so what's your standard? And I I try to walk people into a place where they recognize that they are not using the standard of God, Mm -hmm. right? So I know that it's talking about how to use spiritual gifts, but I think there's application to marriage. So if, if using your spiritual gift without love is problematic, then I would argue being married in Christ without love is problematic, right? Mm-hmm. And so love is patience, it's kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres, never fails. And and we say, this is what the love of God looks like. And then I would hold that up and go, is this what your home looks like? And they'll mm-hmm. say, no. And then I'll say, okay, so then it's not love. And they're like, no, it is, I love them. And so again, they're defaulting. We, we, we tend to default to our position perspective and our position of what we think love looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, There are, uh, it's interesting because um, I always, I I think of, uh, I have an aunt and an uncle who 
love Jesus very much have always uh, been an encouragement to me, uh, particularly um, between 18 and 23 years old. They were just, they'd reach out to me, they'd pray with me. They were just a, a big blessing to me at some really difficult times in my life. And I, uh, I went to visit them for a week or two uh, at one point um, in my early 20s. And uh, I think I showed up like on a Friday and I was there till the next Friday, but she had some really beautiful flowers on this, this entryway table. And then the following Wednesday, he came home from work and brought some really beautiful flowers to her. I was like, oh, these are nice flowers. And she goes, yeah, he brings me flowers every Wednesday. And he wasn't trying to manipulate her. He was, it wasn't, he wasn't like, he just, he brought her flowers every week. He just, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like there was, uh, and you could see that the way they spoke to each other and the way, like there was, there was a genuine affection for one another. And it, it was more than 28 years ago now, 25 years ago now. And it like, it had kind of this indelible mark on how I think, and I don't buy Michelle flowers every week, but what it made me want to do That's is so like, expensive. yeah, <laughs> but, but what it made me want to do is go like, this is a person I love. I want to show mm -hmm. them care. And so what we ought to do as, as Christians is go, okay, how does God show us love? So I, I took it a clue from my uncle and it helped shape a little bit how I treat my wife. What we as believers ought to do is go, how does God love us? And that should shape how I love the people around me. But we tend not to do that. We tend to, um, we tend to go, well, I'm doing better, a better job than my parents did, or I'm doing a better job. What, what I think people don't understand, I, I'm not an expert on it. Um, I, I went to India when I was 23 and it's culturally acceptable for male friends to walk down the street holding hands. And it's not- Same in the Philippines. Yeah, okay. So not culturally acceptable for a husband and wife to walk down the street holding mm -hmm. hands. Um, it is- I don't know if that's the same in the Philippines or not. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, culturally acceptable for a husband to be verbally and physically abusive to his wife and to his kids, right? Culturally acceptable. And we would go, we would say, man, that's not loving. But most of the time, we mm -hmm. we are deciding what's loving or not loving Cultural. based off, off off of our culture or our experience. Yeah. And we can't do that. There, there's not room for us to do that as believers. Yeah, like, that's a great point. That it's like it tends to be culturally based our yeah. viewpoint of love. And and they would say, no, no, I love my wife. I love my kids. You know, that's why I'm doing these things. And we disagree with them based on a cultural position. And what we have to do as Christians is put aside our cultural yeah, so position. Actually, the question you should probably ask now when people say that is, do you mean a cultural love or a biblical love? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think they're two different things. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, I was thinking about this when you were talking about that. I think that there is, there is something that a husband and wife feel that is probably not love, but there is some kind of bond. Oh, you know what? An example similar to when last episode we were, you were talking about the feeling you had about your dad. There was mm -hmm. some kind of connection that um, you felt towards your dad, even though he had given a rip about you your entire life. Like you probably couldn't describe that, right? Like you couldn't, right. you couldn't identify like, why do I feel different about my dad than I do anybody else who's treated me like this in the same way that there's that feeling. And I think what people do in our culture here in the U S or in the West is we typically just say that's love. Like you have some kind of like love for your dad. That's unexplainable, right? Yeah. We use it as kind of a generic term mm -hmm. and that's probably what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Is that we we can describe it like that, but that's not actually what love is because if God's the definition of love, right. then love looks different than that. You can right. say the word all you want. Yeah. And so we're actually, that's what I mean. I think we're actually talking about two different loves. Exactly. Yeah. One's a cultural viewpoint right. to your point about India, which is a great point of what love would look like there. And then, um, and then a viewpoint of like, here's set up in the scriptures. This is God showing an example of what love is. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to say, I feel love for somebody, this is how it would be expressed. Because mm. I think that can, maybe I'm, I'm struggling not with our conversation or like debating you. I'm struggling a little bit understanding what that feeling is that people are expressing. You know, like you've had couples yeah. come in, you're just saying this to you before and said, no, I love my spouse. Right. And you're like, but there's nothing, there's nothing in your life that shows that love. Mm-hmm. 
From a biblical perspective, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, from a biblical perspective, there's nothing that is in line. Like, you say, I love this person. I, I've said this forever. Like, it doesn't matter what you say in that moment. Yeah. If it's contrary to what you do, you bring this point up a lot, and I think it's a great point. If if a husband is having 10 affairs, and then he says, I'm getting better, because now I only have nine affairs. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So I guess same way. It doesn't matter if you say, well, I still love my wife, even though I'm sleeping with nine other women. Yeah. You obviously don't or you wouldn't be sleeping with the nine other women, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that might be differentiated. Let me do the same example, a similar example of someone who, who believers, one of the spouses commits an, commits adultery, has an affair, which I think we've said before, we don't want to use that word anymore. That was back in the day, but has a sexual relationship with someone that's not their spouse. Yeah. Gets caught in it, um, repents, recognizes their stupidity, sets their heart back on Jesus, reconciles with their spouse and moves forward. That's a different scenario than yes. mm -hmm. that might be someone I might say, I think you do love your spouse yeah. because of your response. Mm -hmm. yeah. You weren't being loving in that moment, but I think you really do love them because of how you, like that's a yeah. different situation than the guy who's like, no, I really do love my wife and I'm still sleeping with these nine other women and I'm yeah. refusing to change. That's, it's, that's a very extreme example of what you deal with when someone's like, Right. I love my wife, but I'm I'm gonna verbally batter her consistently. Whatever you know, whatever they're saying to you in, in marriage counseling, yeah, you're saying you don't actually love your wife, but yeah. they're they're kicking back because they're like, no, I they're feel cultural. I feel something yeah. for her that's inexplainable. Yeah, and I think that's what I'm struggling there's a, with. There's a familiarity that that happens. Like, look, you there's a fam <laughs> like, I mean. uh, when you've invested time with somebody, like, because mm -hmm. as people, like, if you think about it, we don't invest a lot of time in other people. Like, you and I, Micah, have known each other for 22 years. We don't socialize a lot. The three of us, we don't socialize a lot mm -hmm. to, with each other. Beyond, um, beyond this stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we get together to do the podcast. We get together for staff meeting. We get together on Sunday mornings. We're the first three people at church on Sunday mornings. But, mm -hmm. like... And, and we've come over to your house for dinner and we're going to, you know, go to your little girl's birthday party sure, or whatever. We should probably do that more. Mm -hmm. um, we probably should. But my point being, the friendship that we have formed over the years mm -hmm. is deeper than most friendships that yeah, people absolutely. have, right? <clears throat> I don't think any of us feel like we're not friends because we don't hang out all 100%. the time. 100%. Yeah. So what, what we have invested with one another has a weight to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if it's bad... What people, what I've learned is that people, even if it's bad, feel that the time invested carries value. Mm. So they place value on the time, which is why people can say, well, they made it for 50 years uh, married, even though most of those years were miserable, but they made it 50 years. So people value time. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's like the inside jokes and the little moments that you have and the little glimpses, you know, that you have of joy or blessing or whatever, like. Like the number of people who said to me, well, you know, like he's still your dad. And they would say that about my dad. Well, he's still your dad. So you should want a good relationship with him. I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. Like, like right. does it result, does it really matter? And like, right. well, he's your dad. And so we place value on these kinds of relationships that from the outset weren't biblical. Right. So, so I value this person that I'm married to because of the time we've invested, but not because of how God values them. Yeah. And so, because I didn't start at the outset with the biblical love as the foundation, I had to fabricate. What I had to do is I had to view the culture I lived in and decide from the culture what love looks like. So mm -hmm. as an example, my mom's dad was, I never met him. He died 10 days before I was born. He was uh, arrested drunk in a gutter. And then I think died in police custody that afternoon um, is the story, something like that. Um, violent, violent drunk, just a mean, mean man from everything I've heard about him, right? Well, my dad was not a violent alcoholic, but he was a womanizer. And so there was a perspective that the home I grew up in was better and safer, definitely so, than the home my mom grew up in, mm -hmm. right? So- Sounds like that's true. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah. So if, if, and this is something you've corrected me on before, Micah, if my perspective towards my children is I want to create a home that was better than the one my mm -hmm. dad created for me. That's a false premise. Mm -hmm. And if I create a home that's better than the one my dad created for me, 
I could, from a cultural perspective, say, I love my boys better than my dad loved me. Yeah. Because I don't perceive that my dad loved me, but I'm doing now what I can right. in response to my dad. Right. And that's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Because then my boys will grow up going, well, man, I just want to do a better job than my dad did. And for none of us has the goal been, I want to love my children like Christ loves my children. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the, the cultural world, this is what I keep going back to whenever I have this conversation with people, especially as it regards love. Back in 2010, uh, November of 2010, there was a book on Amazon for about 24 hours called A Pedophile's Guide to Love and Pleasure, A Child Lover's Code of Conduct. Um, it was on Amazon for less than 24 hours. They received over 2,000 complaints in that 24 hours. Uh, yeah. And it was pulled from their their online. Uh, That's disturbing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the guy says, um, the guy who wrote the book, let's see, says, my attempt is to make pedophile situations safer for those juveniles that find themselves involved in them. <laughs> <laughs> by establishing certain rules for these adults to follow. Um, he, he had talked about how, um, what does he say here? He goes, I hope to achieve this by appealing to the better nature of pedosexuals with the hope that they're doing so will result in less hatred and perhaps um, um, lighter sentences. That's a word. Lighter sentences should they be caught. Um, he says, Pedosexual? Yeah, and he, he says that he published the book to address what he considers unfair portrayals of pedophiles in the media. He says um, true... It's minor attractive persons, right? No, 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 listen, though. <laughs> he says true pedophiles love children and would never hurt them. Um, wow. And, and so so he's... It, that, was, that was his response. He goes on mm. into more stuff to justify um, that he thinks that there should be proper techniques taught for engaging in oral sex and those kinds of things with minor children. And he says he never did that when he was an adult, but only when he was a teenager, did he do that with little children? And, and so oh, he admits that. Yeah. So, so his argument, his argument is that this is love. And I would argue that 99% of our culture would go, heck no, string them up. Right. But my point is that as well, long as long last four years, 98%. Yes. Um, Maybe 90. Mm -hmm. But my, my argument is that as long as, as there isn't a standard for love, eventually this, this was in 2010, so this is 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. It might be back on Amazon now, who knows? But uh, my argument is that as long as there isn't a standard for love, it can ultimately be whatever people decided it is. Yeah. And that will result in the degradation of culture because God is the source of all love. Uh, the other argument, and I'm not saying we have to leave the conversation about love, but the other argument I have the most often with people is when they try to argue to, to me that something is good on the merit that they liked it or they found pleasure in it or that it's not harmful, mm -hmm. right? They'll say, well, this is good because it's not harmful. Yeah. And for us as believers, like I think Psalms 14, Psalm 53, Romans 3 have to come into play that there is no one good right? That, that apart from God, there was no one who is good. There was no one who is righteous, that God alone is good and does good. Mm -hmm. And, and that, uh, because the moment you make people subjectively good, then, then my dad is good by comparison to my mom's dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and you, and most people wouldn't argue against that. They'd so go, really, oh, yeah, he's good. really what you're talking about is the, the, the problem is when believers use a cultural standard for these believers, definitions, because yes. we can't do anything about people with, who don't have the spirit. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> even in the old Testament, Israel struggled with, with these things. I, th I think because they, they rejected God mm -hmm. and didn't have the spirit consistently. So anyways, for those of us that are believers, we can't use a world's, the world's viewpoint or the world's definitions as a standard for how we define those things. And that's, right. that's really what we're rubbing up against right. here is that when someone says, I love my spouse, but they're using a cultural definition, um, it's problematic. There's going to be issues in the relationship because you're using the wrong standard of love. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, what's funny is, you probably haven't had anybody, I'm guessing, I hope you haven't, had anybody in marriage counseling with you go, you know what, um, just trying to be biblical here, I feel like I should have more than one wife. <laughs> no, no one's done that yet. Right? 
because probably most people now agree that that's not okay, right? I think even so, the Bible agrees that that's not okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'll get there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My guess is the majority of people now, if you ask them why, they couldn't give you a biblical answer. Sure. What they would say is it seems wrong. The reason they feel that way is because the culture we're in mm -hmm. says it's wrong. Right. And if you wanted to mess them up, you'd be like, well, even Israel, the nation of Israel was birthed out of, out of more than one wife, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You had a concubine? Yeah, yeah. A two wife and a, uh, a wife. Two wives. Two wives and, and two con concubines. Two concubines, yeah. So that would mess people up. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is God saying it's okay? You know, see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, most people don't know the scripture well enough to even have a biblical viewpoint of why a plurality of wives is not okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. That's my point is like the reason we feel like it's not okay is cultural, yeah. not biblical. And I bet most people are not trying to argue for um, having multiple wives right? because they culturally feel like it's not okay, even right. though they don't have a biblical basis for it. I'm just kind of trying to expose yeah. believers' perspectives being shaped more by culture than by the scriptures. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's easy to make a case biblically as to why that's not okay. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's this episode right now. We could do that in the future. Yeah. yeah. It's it's one of these things that um, we have a future episode scheduled where I, I told you I wanted to talk about 1 Corinthians uh, one thirty, where it says that Christ became for us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, mm -hmm. and redemption. So let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Uh, we as believers, and I'm going to say that this is true about any authentic believer, uh, has to come to the place where they recognize that their righteousness is a matter of the work of Jesus, not our own. And it's by faith. And it's not my work. I didn't contribute to it. I, I am not like, I didn't bring about my own righteousness. I didn't bring about grace and forgiveness. God did that. It is by grace that you've been saved through faith as a gift of God. Mm -hmm. And so, so that being true, that my righteousness is a matter of the work of God in me through faith, that, that my holiness, my sanctification, my wisdom, my understanding of God, all things that are worked in me by God, it's interesting to me that we would default to culture mm -hmm. for a standard of what's good and what's love. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, like it doesn't make any sense. No. And, and so why don't we hold love and goodness to as high as a standard as we do righteousness. Because we care about the culture more than we care about Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's at least a reason. It could be the only reason. Do you, this is a legitimate question. I don't, I don't have a thought on this yet, but it's just what came to mind. So I have mentioned in the past that growing up, what I felt was taught was put faith in Jesus because you need him to go to heaven, need him so that your sins can be forgiven. And then here's an introduction to the law so you can be a good Christian. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible that righteousness and sanctification and redemption, we think of cross things and love and goodness, we think of our work? Like, does that make sense what mm -hmm. I'm asking? Mm -hmm. yeah. That that maybe we've been taught that we you need Jesus for righteousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need Jesus for holiness. You I, need Jesus for redemption. I think, but it's up to you to be loving and I good. I think mm -hmm. what... I mean, maybe people think that way. Although I think that believers, even in West Texas, describe people who aren't believers as good people. Well, that guy's he's a good dude. Yeah. He mm -hmm. doesn't know he doesn't know God, but he's he's a good, good dude. So yeah. I don't so I think even when they describe people that aren't believers, they describe them as good. So I don't know how those two could work together. True. Although I think that you're probably right. They're thinking that almost like there's, there's a double standard. Like mm -hmm. but that I don't understand either. Like, why is that dude good? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's Which, a, there's a sense of morality I don't, that, that we've adopted that that person's ticking most of the boxes. I don't I don't even think I mind I don't think I mind the expression of it that maybe this is contrary to what the Bible says is good. Mm -hmm. So I'm acknowledging mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that that could be a word or a phrase that culture uses to describe somebody. I'm not necessarily negating. Mm -hmm. That guy's he's mm -hmm. he's a good guy. Yeah. I, I, I've yeah. said that about you, people. You get a call from somebody, you work at a company, you get a call from somebody and they're like, hey, so-and-so interviewed with us. What do you think of them? Oh, they're a good worker. They're a good, yeah. 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 He's, he's a good dude. I, yeah. I've said that about people with, and I haven't thought in that moment. I'm trying to use the context of what the scriptures calls good. So sure. I, that's what I mean. I'm acknowledging that there's a, sure. maybe a distinction in language there. Agreed. Maybe it needs a shift. I'm acknowledging that as well. But I, I think that that's where the trouble comes in is because 
Now, if I, I've said that about people, uh, he's a good dude who's not a believer. Now, if I'm trying to describe goodness from the scripture, it's problematic because I've just used the word in a different way. And, and maybe, maybe it comes down to us just being smart enough to handle it. Like, um, where if the three of us were looking to bring on a fourth pastor, uh, or elder, if we're looking and obviously this, it wouldn't happen this way because it would be somebody we know really well, but uh, but let's pretend that we're trying to bring somebody on. Somebody recommends somebody to us, and the per- it's uh, Britton Carter recommends someone to mm-hmm. us, and Britton goes, "He's a good dude." That we have an idea of what Britton's probably going to mean by that. This yeah, is somebody yeah, yeah. who's walking with the Lord. This is somebody. Mm-hmm. If it's if it was my dad who didn't know Jesus and say, "Oh, this guy's a good dude," I know what that my dad means by yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe. Maybe it's incumbent upon us who are pursuing the Lord to ask that question in those conversations, like to 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 make that a clear a clarifying point. Uh, like what do you mean? Yeah, because if our right. aim is to know God and make Him known, like to be people who represent Christ well, and somebody comes up to us and we're not sure where what they mean by good, mm-hmm. and they say so and so is a good person, we can say because they know Christ or culturally, like what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, and have the conversation. I don't know that it works every time, but no, that I feel like that one's actually more difficult than love. Yeah. Because I think that, well, maybe not, maybe love is more deeply rooted. I'm just thinking language. Like it's, I feel like it's easier to make a distinction, um, biblically. Yeah. Like here's what love looks like. Agreed. Good is like a, like a little more ambiguous in terms of that. But I think it's important because if, if someone says, um, this thing's good. Yeah. Gosh, that's hard too. Well, Cause I'm going to say Titus, like, Titus talks several times about like doing the good deeds of, of God and those kinds of things. And so we should do a deep dive on this because I think that this could be another episode we should do on like, what is, what is biblical goodness or like, mm-hmm. what is it to do yeah. good? Cause I'm even thinking like, it's difficult with language with English at least, because I'm going to say, oh my gosh that ice cream was so good. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Or that Dr. Pepper was good. Like, right. In it, the same way that we talk about, I love such and such. You yeah. Know? Or yeah. I yeah. love that movie. Yeah. yeah. So it's, maybe it's, a. Uh, it's, it's hard because, I, because when, when someone says to you in marriage counseling, I love my spouse, they're not talking about a love in the same way that I loved the movie. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a different description. Yes. And well, and in the Greek, even though the Greek New Testament only uses three of them. In the Greek language, there were five different words used for love. So they were they were able to make it a little bit more precise. Yeah, we, we don't make one, it more precise. Right. Yeah. But I, I do think that that especially okay, let's move aside from goodness for a moment. I I think especially all right. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I know we're all having problems with this one. <laughs> so so one of the things that I like to say is that uh, God is love, First John 4. Uh, love exists in the person and the character of God. Also, God is good. That exists in the mm-hmm. person and the character of God. And it exists, both of those exist in the person and the character of God prior to creation mm-hmm. because they exist in the person and character of God. And so mankind was made on day six. And whether you take a, a literal day perspective of that or a long time perspective of that, the point is that love and goodness existed prior to mankind mm-hmm. because love and goodness exist in the heart of who God is, mm-hmm. right? And and so that's that's what we're pursuing. We're pursuing an understanding of what is what does that mean? This thing mm-hmm. that exists outside of who I am. This thing yeah. that exists outside of my scope of experiences and knowledge. What is it that exists in the very heart of God that is loving, that is good? And and so it's um, this is how God demonstrates his own love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like there is a, uh, there is a love that is active contrary to people's deserved yeah. treatment. Yeah. Right. Uh, the goodness of God, one of my favorite verses, I'm going to misapply or I'm going to give the wrong reference probably, but it's something like one song, uh, one nineteen sixty eight, something like that. That says God is good and does good. It's 67. Is it? I'm just kidding. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> uh, but but the Lord is good and does good. Like everything that God does is good. Yeah. Which which changes how we evaluate the flood story 
that's happening in yeah. Genesis 7. Yeah. That God is good in that because he is destroying the wicked, right? There's a goodness in that that's inherent that culturally, yeah. culturally people would say is wicked. Right. Yeah. I was, I was going to say the problem is, is that we use our definition to to as a filter for, right. for God. Right. Mm -hmm. So people even say like, I couldn't believe in a God who would who do these, these things. things. It's because you have a standard of what you believe is right and good. Yeah. And if, if something doesn't fit that standard you've created, you're in essence setting yourself up to be God. Right. And so, if, yeah. And if God is, is perfect, holy, right, righteousness, I can't say embodied because he's spirit and not form, but like if, and if, then it would not be good for that holy, righteous God to endure wickedness. Yeah. And it would be good for him to deal with wickedness. Yeah. yeah. But from a cultural perspective, we rise up against that and go, how could God do that? That's a cultural mm -hmm. response. And, and so what I'm what I'm longing for in myself, and I don't know, Micah, is great questions about biblical good. I cannot wait for us to have these conversations. There are at least three topics I want to do with you guys, this one included, that I think we actually need to think on and talk it's about more talking, yeah. before we get to it. But what, what I want to do as a follower of God is let him be the standard for how I think and approach life. And, and his love and his goodness has to flow from him. Here's, here's what we do. Day six, and I, I still lean towards a literal six days, but uh, day six, Jesus or God rather, well, Jesus, also John 1. So everything that's been made has been made through Christ and nothing was, anyway, I don't have to defend that. So Colossians 1, John 1. So the, the Father and the Son created mankind, right? Love existed prior to that. And what we tend to do as humans is we measure love and goodness based on how people interact with other people. And for us to get to the heart of love and goodness, we have to acknowledge that it existed apart from people completely apart from people. Yeah. And we have to begin to get at the heart of what that looks I'm like. I'm wondering, total wonder. Yeah. If the the viewpoint of like the cultural viewpoint of love you're describing mm -hmm. is like a tainted version of the real thing. Uh, yeah. So like it, it's an idol. Yo, know, yeah, well I mean like there's there's an essence of the reality of, of God's love in our viewpoint. Absolutely. That is at the core, but it's tainted yeah. because of sinful man. Yeah. It's a, uh, what's the word that I want? It's um, tainted is going to have to work because I can't think of the other word, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a mutation of, mm -hmm. of what, that's not the word I want either, but yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. And so there's, maybe that's the, we're, we're trying to, what we're doing, it's, it's a, uh, it's Jeremiah two again, um, or yeah, we're we're exchanging the holy for the profane. Yeah, um, yep. Like the, I've just been something that's been like I, I'm struggling with as we're talking through this is that I feel like there's an essence when someone says like that's good or I love somebody that that they really mean it. And they totally mean it. it um, They're convinced of it. Yeah, it, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Sorry, and and I'm wondering if the reality of that feeling is because it has a basis in truth, but is not the actual thing. Yes, um, and is a lie that is based on the truth in the same way that the enemy has lied about all the other things. That's Absolutely, so close to the truth, and that's the that's the thing that pulls people. I think away from God towards things that are not God is because it, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's Genesis. As I said earlier, Genesis three. Yeah. When, when the serpent, when Satan's like, did God really say you shouldn't eat of that? It's questioning the truth of who God is. Right. Um, and maybe that's the difficulty is like, we feel, we feel it so heavy because it has a basis in truth. Right. But it's not truth because it's it's a tainted version of it, a mutation, whatever you want to call it. It's not the same thing. Well, it, look, we we're we're people who compare things, right? We compare things. We talked about it on the last one or the one before that if you're if your kid the first a uh, couple of weeks ago, I guess we we talked about uh, if your kid is comparing their awards to the other person's mm -hmm. awards, then like comparison is the thief of joy. I don't remember who said that, but whoever said that, I agree. Uh, I think you said that. No, no, no. Like it's a famous quote. Oh. He's yeah. Micah. <laughs> yeah. He's not me. So, so 
whoever whoever that quote's rightly attributed to, comparison is the thief of joy. Now, imagine for a moment, let's go back to what we talked about last week in C.S. Lewis, and he was saying that all these hints of love and joy and stuff that we have in this world are a, a shadow, if you will, mm-hmm. of the divine, mm-hmm. right? And he go, and he said it's a fragrance of a flower not seen. He he goes on to say it's the uh, it's the it's the humming of a tune you've not heard. Right? It's like this this thing. So if if you don't have a correct perspective of God, then you're left comparing y- your standard of love and good to all the other standards of love and good around you. Mm. And you're going yeah. And and you if you're completely honest, you'll say, oh man. Uh, what we're doing here is love and it's good and it's way better than the family that I grew up in. And then you might say, but man, it's not as good as, as P- what Pierce and Hannah have. Like if I'm looking at Pierce and Hannah, man, I'm, I want to be better. So we do that. The moment, and, and as long as we're doing that, is if I'm comparing myself to Pierce and Hannah, if I'm comparing myself to Micah and Camir, then I'm going to feel proud or I'm going to feel like a failure or whatever. The moment we all compare ourselves to God, we go, okay, like this is something yeah. dynamically different, yeah. mm-hmm. and it and it forces us to recognize that our perspective is small. Mm-hmm. But as long as we're comparing ourselves to other people, like it, th- this is this is why Paul says, or this is part of why Paul says, he, he goes, um, he goes, I don't even convict myself. He goes, I'm not worried about what other people think about <laughs> me. I don't, I don't even convict myself in this because before God I stand or fall. Like yeah. you know, it, yeah, yeah. I'm paraphrasing there, but that's First uh, Corinthians 10, and and he's like, I'm, like he's not comparing himself to other people, and he's like, man, it's it's before God that I stand. It's before God that that these things are right, and so if we could get to the place where we we like you rightly correcting me months ago or years ago, Micah saying it's not enough for you, Ryan, to, to want to do a better job than your dad did. You want to, you need to want to show your kids the gospel of Jesus until the gospel, until the heart of God is our aim. What we understand as love and good will always be a mutation um, of the truth. Yeah. Or at least it'll fall short. Yeah. Which is, I think what people misunderstand is it's, that means it's different. Yeah. It's not the same thing. No, it's not. Can't be. I, there's just so many things rattling around in my head right now in terms of that. Cause I think that like, if you went, if you went to, I'm trying to think of an example. If you went to, <laughs> this is a dumb example, but if you went to Woodstock in 69 <laughs> and you were like, you guys don't actually love each other. They would all be like, they wouldn't believe you. No, like yeah. this is our definition of love or even the, uh, the, the woke Methodist conference where, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, that, they would say this is more loving. Mm-hmm. They would say it's more loving to be tolerable or accepting of everybody's viewpoint of sexuality. Yeah. And, and like, that's, that's a definition of what you mean by love, but mm-hmm. it's BS. And it's, like it's, it's based off of their standard. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so that's my, my struggle is like, all right, let me get a little bit like deep philosophical for a moment. <clears throat> um, well, I'm not going to go that deep. <laughs> there, there's no one righteous. Right. No one good. No one who seeks God. Right. Um, that I understand that to be the reality. Like well, there aren't people going, you know what? I really want to find my way to God. There's, there's no right. one who's seeking God. No one who has an innate righteousness that allows them to stand before God. It's, we are, you know, enemies of God, worthless, separated from God, sinful. Objects of God's wrath. Yes. Objects of God's wrath. Genesis three, um, the fall happens. Um, and it doesn't say this. Genesis one, we're made in the image of God, man right. and woman, made in the image of God. And we, he says, go be fruitful and multiply to Adam and me, even seemingly multiply my image. I'm adding that in, but it I feels agree. like it's contextually fitting. Go multiply my image. It seems to be the point of, yeah. of, of that statement is like replicate my image. Um, something is lost in Genesis three, right at the fall. Um, that seems to be regained. It seems to is regained in Jesus. Ephesians and I believe Colossians say that we in Christ are again made in the likeness of God, given the new self again, made in the likeness of God. It's like when, when we are in Christ, we are again brought back to a place sure. where we fulfill the intention of Genesis one, where we now are the image of God again. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like there's something that was maintained that has an essence of the image of God in mankind as a whole 
but is not the actual image of God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That we were made in the image of God and that was somehow also reflected in maybe how we were built, how we are made in terms of our bodies, made in terms of our- A lot of people uh, say soul, mind, and body. Emotions, like th those kind of things. Like there's there's almost like there's a remnant maybe of it. Mm -hmm. That's a bad word to use because that's a good connotation. Though. There's, there's an essence of something that's left over that was lost. The, the image is lost in Genesis 3 but I feel like there's something that is an essence that is still there. Okay. So I, I wonder if, again, this is just me throwing this out. I wonder if when someone is so stuck to saying, I know I really do understand love or that really is good. If there is an essence of people, I'm acknowledging no one's righteous, no one's good, no one seeks God, but that there's an essence of something in us that is like longing to be at the truth again, mm -hmm. to understand real love, to understand real goodness, to actually be the image of God again, because yeah. the essence is still there. Like almost not that you want to, not that people who aren't saved want to be saved on their own. What I'm saying is like, almost like you're saying, I'm longing to actually have a real love relationship, but I, they're not admitting this. They can't. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. Yeah. it's longing for the truth. Maybe, maybe similar to the God size hole in somebody's heart. I don't think it's the same thing Pascal was saying, but maybe the, maybe the gist of what that's after of like, there is something inside of us that like has a, an affection or affinity for something that is left over. If that makes sense, maybe not for God in terms of a right relationship with him. Yeah. I don't think it can be that, but that there's something like when someone's so stuck to love, I really love them. I'm wondering if it's like based on a a feeling that is longing for the genuine, authentic thing, if that makes sense. And then maybe that's, my thought is, maybe that's why people who don't know Jesus can never be completely fulfilled in their love relationships is because it's a different standard. It's an yeah. idol. It's not the real thing. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I can know any of that. That's just all the stuff that's been rattled around. Rattled I mean, around, I would, I would argue that the love of God is, I feel safe in saying this, uh, that the love of God is, is the highest thing that we can know. Like, yeah. Well, uh, and it's Ephesians three says he's beyond comprehension. Yeah. So that, that's the highest thing I think that we can know. Like Romans talks about it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Like, um, yeah. I, so, if if love and i think this is what our culture is pursuing maybe the culture also agrees that love is the highest thing we can know mm. and and so they're just trying to pursue it apart from god mm -hmm. and we're trying to pursue it in light of god yeah maybe that's a very shorter and simpler way of saying what i was trying to get at yeah. that that it's like they're they're after almost like after the same thing they just can't get it yeah and yeah. they they recognize there's a recognition that love is the highest thing mm. that this world can offer mm. um but it's the wrong standard but it's the wrong standard and it's the wrong origin it's the wrong you know wellspring and so it it, it leaves you unsatisfied or dissatisfied or not satisfied even <laughs> One of those. <laughs> so is what you're saying, Micah, because of humanity, like pre-fall, pre-sin, was created to enjoy the love of God, to enjoy fellowship and community and things like that. Um, now sin has tainted that, but there's still some sort of desire that's not necessarily I was seeking thinking more God. image, not enjoy okay. love or community or fellowship. Because we were created in the image of God. Is that interesting? Yeah. I, again, my thought, I don't know exactly what that means holistically. Mm -hmm. I do know what Ephesians and Colossians say that we are again made, given the new self again, made in the likeness of God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily the relationship, but that there is something left. That over. makes more sense. Yeah, There's yeah, something yeah. left over. Yeah. There, there. So I've, I've said that for a while. I'm curious, like y'all's thoughts. I, I haven't talked about it or preached it by any means, but like I I've, I've thought in those, in those regards of like, the way that people, I mean, I think you said it really, really well, Ryan, of just like, there's still this meaning or still this intentionality of setting love at the highest uh, thing to be pursued, whatever the, from, from a worldly standard instead of a godly standard. And I've, 
I've said that in regards to love and relationships, but also in regards to like community, how there is still like, even just the way psychologists mm. study people who mm. are left alone. I think that there's, there is an innate need for community yeah, in that's some, in some regard. Yeah. Where and does I, it come from? I think that, I think that, that bleeds from the image of God thing. So like, I think for a while I've just in the back of my head thought of, yeah, we were created in the image of God and sin has tainted that and we can't get back to that place on our own, yeah, but there yeah. is still so, uh, so, look, so you're basically ex- expanding on what I was saying. You're yeah. saying like, not just like, like who we are as, what you say? A second, you know, mind, soul, and body. Yeah. Something like I, that, I don't know that I completely it. agree with that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, just but, as yeah. a, for lack of a better way to describe that, you're actually saying Pierce to add on to that, that we were kind of created to be these certain kind of beings, like Absolutely. things sure. like community with other people, uh, love. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I would, I would even say, like the parent child relationship they've mm-hmm. done they've they have seen that like in orphanages and different places where babies aren't handled all the time and loved on all the time the difference in their development yeah. compared mm-hmm. to those who are held and I've even on. seen yeah. studies about like how quickly you get a baby after they're born onto skin of the parents yeah, like, yeah. I, like it's wild it is wild and like to your point Pierce I think this is what I'm saying where does that come from yeah, yeah. yeah. and and that's almost what I'm thinking is like there are these innate desires in us. I feel like people are, are longing to have fulfilled and because the standard's wrong, they're constantly frustrated or yeah, exactly. all or the unsatisfied, dissatisfied, whatever yeah, other ones you said. Not yeah. even satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> or they're constantly shaping a new standard to try to maintain whatever it may be. They're trying to constantly rewrite no, whatever that's the standard it, is. is. Through history, there has constantly mm-hmm. been a, like a reformulating of standards exactly. trying to get to the real thing. Yeah. And I think that's the freaking lie. Mm-hmm. They're constantly the enemies, trying to tweak it. The yeah. enemy has consistently said, um, here, here's the way you can be satisfied. Started in Genesis three. Mm-hmm. Eve, here's how you can be satisfied. Mm-hmm. And and then she did it to Adam, and Adam. Anyways, so like, when people say, "Look how bad yeah. our world is right now," no, it's the same. It's always been. Exactly. It's yeah. just maybe more chaotic because you know the internet allows it to go all over the world. Yeah. The lie has been the same from Genesis three. Absolutely. It's just fabricated in different ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So until we return to God as the standard for those things, yeah. there's no solution. Right. Absolutely. And honestly, and maybe this is where we should end in the the thought, because I think it's such a genius topic, is until believers begin to live that way, we will not be a clear picture of God as Can't be. the gospel. Absolutely. As long as we're using the standard that the world offers to us, then yeah, we cannot represent the gospel well. I did mm-hmm. hear a positive stat recently, <laughs> or at someone's take on a stat. The, the divorce rate in the church is not actually as high as people say it is mm. because it is a calculating for the people who get divorced over and over and over again. Mm. So for the people that are believers, I think we have an opportunity in our marriages to show the relationship that Jesus has with the church, mm-hmm. to paint a clear picture of the gospel. And as we Supposed continue to, to yeah. well, I think, no, I'm saying the opportunity. We yeah. have the opportunity, right? Yeah. When we take that opportunity, we are combating the lie of the enemy yeah. by putting the gospel in the forefront yeah. as this is this is the place that people find satisfaction. Because the reality is I can't argue with someone who thinks they know love. Right. Mm-hmm. I can't convince them that that's not love. Right. What I can convince them of is that there's something better. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like the dissatisfaction you feel in your love what if I told you that could be fulfilled because God's love is even beyond comprehension. That's how good it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it can be a reality mm-hmm. in your life. In you your can marriage. have that yeah. right now. Yeah. I feel like that was a really messy way to get around to that. Like I liked it. simpler viewpoint. Mm-hmm. That's an example of a topic where we like kind of feel like we know what we're talking about and then we get into it and I'm like, I don't know. Well, I, I, I feel like there's, I feel like we could do two or three more episodes on it, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll revisit it in a year. Absolutely. So maybe maybe a simpler viewpoint, because you're about to ask me, Pierce, mm-hmm. that is um, as believers, our standard um, needs to be God mm-hmm. so that the world can see a clear picture of God in us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and what you'd said as well, like within that is going to be the only place of satisfaction. Like yeah. the, to the fulfillment of that. Which is such a beauty, like uh, from looking from a from a practical standpoint as well, just our relationship with the Lord is like now we are we are freed and have the opportunity to live out and dwell in 
godliness. Yeah. Which is like, which is so beautiful. I mean, with, 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 with now, even like with the perspective, like continuing off this conversation of the mentality that we've been created in the image of God and we've been reconciled and restored and renewed in that is that now we're no longer like that. That's an aspect of like freedom from sin. Like we're no longer chained to having to behave like the world, but not only have we been empowered uh, practically in regards to actions, but our eyes have been opened and we've been able to see how God is, has very intri- uh, intricately, intimately and like, um, intensely like i didn't mean to do all those but, but but i did it uh designed certainly how no right designed yeah, certain things designed the design of marriage the design of of just i mean just just love in general how we love and interact with people how we enjoy uh, and interact with community and what our roles can be within that like how god has has made us to be we now are empowered to be and how much freeing that that is and how how beautiful it is um, and how impactful that is in regards to the power of the cross and the empty grave and the Holy Spirit within us, which is, it's beautiful. And I think that, that too often, again, I think this comes back to the simpler mentality that we've been talking about for four years now is like, we overcomplicate so much of what we should do as Christians based off of our actions, instead of just dwelling in, we talked about this last episode, the reality of who God's made us to be. I went back and revisited some, some songs that I had written years ago and EPs that we written between 2011 and 2015. And I was just like, man, God, thank you for like shaping perspective that I had had back things. I was anticipating to go back and be like, these are the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. But there was like this, the, God was stirring up in my heart, like this mentality of like embrace the reality of what, who God is and what he has done. And there's a couple, so that's the reason why Mark, who created a band later named Embrace, he was like, you use the word embrace a lot. I think part of it was the Lord was really clean, like pushing me like, there's a whole chant at the end of one of the songs was embrace freedom, embrace reality, like embrace the freedom we have in Christ and embrace the reality of who God is. And it's not like till now that I think that there's a lot of that put into action in regards to preaching in regards to teaching in regards to, to, to some of the individual people that I'm pouring into and things like that of just like, this is who God is. Rest in it. Rest in who God is. Rest mm-hmm. in who God's made you be because that's the foundation, not what anything we can do, but who Christ is and what he's done. Absolutely. So, what was your band name? Uh, I was in a band called In One Accord that, right. that traveled That's a bunch. Right. Yeah. Which is so funny because Spotify has merged a gospel band called In One Accord <laughs> and, and our In One Accord account. Wait, merged? Yeah. So like, I'll pull it up real quick. So if you look Wait, for- Is this the In One Accord group that I used to show you pictures of that mess with you? It might be. Like a bunch, it of, might bunch be. of older ladies. Oh, no. It's, it's, it's a- Oh, that's it's funny. A, so there, there's our two EPs, and then there's He Will Provide, which is <laughs> that's awesome. Which is so funny. It's a giant group of people, like it's a like, choir. It's like a black choir, yeah. <laughs> which is great. You know that sounds good. So you've got these white metal heads in this in this black church choir, which is great. I, I want to know who's more surprised. Like when people who are trying to listen to which one in one quarter more surprised. <laughs> we should do that. That would be so funny. I'm gonna say who are you looking for? I'm gonna say it's the other people that are more shocked <laughs> yeah, than yeah, your yeah, people. Yeah. yeah, right. That's so funny. Oh man, that's oh. good. So yeah. Cool. Uh, I'd like to do an AI generated version where we took a video of the other M1 Accord <laughs> yeah. and then did your music, the music over the top. It'd be so good, man. That'd be so funny. Oh, cool. So you've done a simpler review. You've done all the fun stuff. Do you guys have anything to add to that? It's a good episode. That was fun. I like this episode. Yeah. I like I like all of our episodes, but this one, I enjoyed I, the conversation. I really like that we have a list of future episodes too, because I get so stressed sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, crud, what are we going to talk about next time? Yeah. Well, you know who doesn't stress me out? That's Steven. Stephen, we're at the Garden Audio as always. Stephen takes care of all the audio here at Simpler. So if you want to uh, find him on social media at 87 Realty Group, that's him and his wife's realty team. Go tell him thank you for the episode. Or if you just want to leave a comment wherever you're watching or listening, just showing Stephen some love. He's awesome. He's great. Uh, while you are over at the social medias, we are at Simpler Pod. All of our social medias, as well as uh, personal and extended social medias of the of the Simpler community and just us as individuals, is all tagged in the show notes below. So you'll find um, you'll find Simpler Pod, you'll find Simpler Bible, you'll find all of our personal pages, you'll find links to uh, Eagles Wings as well as with the the Eagles Wings ministry, excuse me, the Disc Golf ministry group that uh, Micah teams up with and goes on uh, professional um, to, to professional tournaments and things like that to 
to preach the gospel, to build community. Uh, go learn more about the ministries and the groups that's got going on in the simpler community. It's awesome. And if you want to be involved in in a in a financial way or in a deeper way or however, whatever that looks like, shoot us some messages. There, there are opportunities to message on social media. Uh, reach out through the different websites, Simpler Bible website, through Micah's personal ministry page, all these different ways to get connected. Um, and it doesn't just have to be Simpler Podcast, but if that's all you're interested in, we're excited that you're here. We're excited you're a part of it. You're excited that we're, excuse me, that you're a part of the Simpler community. Hey, as always, keep Christ as core. What could be simpler than that? We'll catch y'all in June. Bye.